Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who plays golf just like John Daly on a bender. He is the captain. Some athletes take a pre-workout. Some athletes do cocaine. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Apocalypse Cow by the hardworking artist over at Three Floyds Brewing. That's right, they are beer artists, my friend. Garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. Three Floyds stuck to their guns and they brewed a beer that is not normal. This is a complex double IPA with intense citrus and floral hop aroma, but balanced with a velvety malt body. Apocalypse Cow was brought to us by these awesome cowgirls and cowboys. First up, we have Matthew in Parts Unknown, and we also have Nikki in Parts Unknown. Yeah, and just a note to Matthew, your VHS tapes, they're past due. Your rental is past due, my friend. You need to bring back those tapes. Next up, we have Jenny and John in Los Angeles, California. And a big shout out to Jessica in San Raymond, California. We also have Molly in Helper, Utah. And last but not least, a big thank you to Lindsay in Issaquah, Washington. All right, a big shout out to everybody. Thanks for donating. Thanks for keeping the lights on. We like your jam. Yeah, thanks for the apocalypse, Cal. If you want to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. Yeah, and while you're on the website, check out the merch page. We have a few of the Team Nick tank tops left. We're going to be doing a pre order really soon for the Douche Canoe shirts, so check that out. It'll be the last time I do a pre order for the Douche Canoe shirts for at least the next year. All right, that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer, grab a canoe. Let's talk some true crime. Life is full of tiny little moments. In the long run, some of them matter and some of them don't. In the end, most of those tiny little moments are forgotten because most of the time, it's just another ordinary day. Tuesday, July 9th, 1959, should have been just another ordinary day, full of tiny, forgettable moments. But it wasn't because a little girl went missing and two days later her body is found she had been brutally murdered there are so many questions about that now infamous day so many tiny moments that if some of them maybe just one were different then that little girl might still be alive What if a teenage boy didn't ride his bike to the schoolyard that evening? What if that little girl didn't have an argument with her parents at the dinner table? What if she didn't ask that boy for a ride? What if he had turned her down and just went off by himself to play with his friends? Would she still be alive? Lynn Harper was born to Leslie and Shirley Harper on August 31st, 1946, 
in New Brunswick, Canada. Her real name is Cheryl, but she goes by Lynn. She is the middle child with an older brother, Barry, and an older brother, Jeffrey. Her father, Leslie, joined the military and the family relocated to the RCAF base in Clinton in 1957. Lynn is a socially active child, spending much of her time in the Girl Guides. Uh, that's like the Girl Scouts or what do they call that? The Brownie Scouts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she attended Sunday school as well. Now, the RCAF base is an Air Force base, uh, which is actually just a little south of Clinton, which is in Ontario. Now, in 1959, Lynn is in the seventh grade at the Air Vice Marshal Hugh Campbell School. I wonder what kind of sport teams that school had back then. Can't you just picture Air Vice Marshal Hugh Campbell School on a on a little kid's <laughs> team jersey? Anyway, she is in the seventh grade, but mm-hmm. this is one of those split classes. So this is a seventh slash eighth grade shared class. One of Lynn's classmates is 14-year-old eighth grader Stephen Truscott. Now, Stephen is a popular athletic kid. Uh, He spends a lot of time playing at the river, which is nearby. This is a popular spot for all of the kids in the area. Mm -hmm. You know, they would go swimming, fishing. There's, there's plenty of things to do down at the river. It's very similar when you think about it. If you watch the first it Stephen King's it, Mm -hmm. you know, the time period that this case is based in and the time period that when they're children it's based in and how those children would go down to the river and play and, you know, create a dam and all that stuff. On Tuesday, June 9th, 1959, Lynn Harper came home from school and she got into an argument with her parents. She then went to her Girl Guides brownies meeting. Mm -hmm. Um, At around 7 p.m., she sees Stephen Truscott in the schoolyard. Now, Lynn asks Stephen, what is he doing? Well, he says he's going to go down to the river to see if there are any other kids there. Lynn asks if he would take her to the highway. Uh, Steven has a bike with him and she wants a ride. He says, of course, I'm going down that way anyway. So yeah, I will take you. She asked Steven Truscott for a ride to the highway so she could visit a farm to see some ponies. Uh, this is what Lynn called or referred to as the white house down on highway eight. Uh, this is a farm with animals, but more importantly to Lynn with, with these ponies that she wants to see. Mm Mm-hmm. So Stephen Truscott gave her a ride on the handlebars of his bike down the gravel road. Well, what's going to be very important in this case is to be able to visualize uh, this scene. Mm -hmm. So just think of it as a straight line. And at the bottom of that straight line, we're going to have the school. Mm -hmm. You go up a little bit further, you're going to have the area that we're going to call the bush. That bush is going to be on the, the right side. And when we talk about bush, it's a, it's a little dirt road that leads off into the brush, right? Yeah, like a wooded area. So you have the school, you have the bush, right? Mm-hmm. Go a little bit further on that straight line, and you will have a bridge that passes over the water. That's the water that Stephen is talking about. Mm-hmm. Go a little bit further on that straight line, and that runs to a stop sign, and that is going to be Highway or State Route 8. Yes. So we have, now we have uh, Lynn on the handlebars riding on Steven's bike. He's pedaling along. This is when Lynn tells Steven about the argument that she got into with her parents that took place at dinner time. Um, they pass a wooded area that the captain mentioned, which is known to the kids in the area as Farmer Lawson's Bush. Mm-hmm. Farmer Lawson owned a big farm in this area, and that's what they called this little wooded area that's off this dirt road. Well, what's this argument about? Uh, I'm unclear about what this argument is about. And it, I mean, she's in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. It it could be something silly. She came home late from school or, you know, a carryover from some, some former disagreement that they've had. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't sound like this. I think if this argument was more of a big deal, we would know more about it. Yeah. Or if it was more significant to the actual case. Mm hmm. Well, they pass that area known as Farmer Lawson's Bush, and then they go over the bridge. So Lynn rode on his bike, on Stephen's bike, for about 1.2 kilometers. So it's like three quarters of a mile, roughly. Okay. All right. So she rode on the handlebars on a gravel road, probably not too comfy. You know what I mean? Yeah, but this is back, you know, again, in the 50s. 
they had the big swooping handlebars. So it was really easy to kind of sit somebody in the middle of those handlebars. Mm -hmm. And then, then you'd pedal along. But, so, but this also makes, you know, obviously their presence to be a lot bigger because you now have two individuals on the bike. Yeah. And trying to visualize this, like the captain said, it's very important. So by this point, they've left the schoolyard. They go past the wooded area known as Lawson's Bush, and they've gone over the bridge. Now they're making their way toward that intersection with the uh, Highway 8. Mm -hmm. um, this is where uh, Lynn asked Stephen to let her off of the bike. Um, he says that she said she would hitchhike the rest of the way. Um, the farm is less than half of a kilometer away from this drop-off point. So Stephen lets her off of the bike and he turns his old bike around and he heads back into uh, town, quote unquote town. Well, and worst case scenario, she'll just walk the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. So Stephen, he did, however, stop his bike. He stopped his bike on the bridge when he was returning and he sees some kids playing in the river there. Mm -hmm. uh, while he's standing on the bridge, he turns and he looks back at the highway and he sees Lynn getting into a car. Yeah, he's going to see Lynn get into a Chevy. And what's kind of odd about this is, uh, you know, back in the day, especially in the 50s, that you'd have very uh, unique um, bumpers and, and headlights and taillights and all that stuff. So he sees kind of a unique taillight, kind of looks like big eyes. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that's kind of interesting here is that Steven sees some kind of orange object that's on the car, like maybe a bumper sticker or something like that. Yeah, it's often reported that this would have been a yellow or orange license plate or possibly an orange or yellow bumper sticker. At 11.20 p.m. that night, Lynn's father, Leslie, reported his daughter as missing. Now, at some point, he must have heard through the grapevine that the, the two kids were spotted together by other neighborhood kids at some point that evening mm -hmm. because there are reports that he went to Steven Truscott's house and asked him about, you know, where he had last seen his daughter. Has he heard from her? You know, he's, he's out looking the neighborhood for his daughter. Right. Um, it's, it's not reported what they actually spoke about. What, what Steven, he's only 14 spoke with Lynn's father about that evening. Um, I would imagine that, that he's probably hearing a similar story to what we just heard, uh, that he'd last seen her getting into a car at Highway 8. Um, one thing that we should kind of underline here before we go much further is that he says he saw Lynn getting into a car. He doesn't say that he saw her being pulled into a car. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's going to be something that is key. Now, the next morning on June 10th at around 9.30 a.m., 14-year-old uh, Stephen Truska is pulled from his class, and he's asked to sit in a police cruiser where he will be interviewed. Uh, this is Constable Hobbs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, after last week, we have another Officer Hobbs, right? Yeah. Um, anyway. Very popular. Yeah. Anyway, he, he when asked about their trip to go see the pony, Stephen tells the officer that he gave her the ride, he let her off of his bike at the intersection, just like we had said. On his way back, he sees her getting into a car. And Stephen, just like the captain said, gets a good description of this vehicle. And um, there, there are a couple versions of this description anyway. They're not too far off from one another, so I'll let you be the judge of how good of the description is. But one report says Stephen said that he saw a gray 1959 Chevrolet possibly a Bel Air with either that yellow or orange license plate or yellow or orange bumper sticker. Another says that he saw a late model Chevrolet, possibly a Bel Air with a lot of chrome on it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm guessing the reason for more than one report is as we're going to see here, Stephen is going to be asked what happened to Lynn many times by several different officers and several different people. Uh, so I think we should be clear here. This is not a situation of what I believe where Steven is changing his story. Um, I, th I think this is, those are both, those are both descriptions that sound very like one another. Well, and like we were saying, uh, and kind of what we led on to in the trailer was, you know, you're not expecting her to go missing. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, how much details are you paying attention to? You see a car, you kind of remember this, you remember that. 
you know, especially in banking, you know, we had to take tests all the time on, you know, watching robberies. And then they'd ask us questions about the robbery afterwards. So we could kind of train ourselves for when, if, or if we ever got robbed, uh, what we could remember. Mm -hmm. And it, it always changes. And again, that's when you're being, you know, you'd mess up the little tiny things. And that's when you know that there's a test. So, yeah. so you got to assume that there's going to be some things messed up because obviously Stephen didn't know there was going to be a test. Well, the other thing too, Captain, is your answer could change depending on whom you're speaking with because, I mean, think about it this way. If, if I'm 14 years old and somebody asked me about the vehicle I saw, okay, I saw her getting into a 59 Chevrolet, probably a Bel Air. Mm-hmm. Well, are you sure it was a 59? You do you really want to do we want to say that it was a 59 or do we want to say that it was a newer car? Right. Chevrolet. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was a newer one. Um so I think that's where we have these little discrepancies here. Um now the this should be a really good possible lead here, right? Um mm-hmm. the the other thing is that at some point Stephen gives them a plate number. Uh, he, he got a plate number off of the car. The, the problem with this is the plate number doesn't really go anywhere. Um, they're able to check the number that he reports to them. They're not able to, you know, this could be one of several different things. Okay. One, either that plate number didn't actually exist, you know, when they punched it into the system. Right. Or two, if it did exist, it didn't have a matching car. Uh, that, that went along with that, that plate, as far as his description goes. The other thing too, is it's very likely that if a plate of that number existed, it could have been somebody from, you know, far away or out of the area. My suspicion on this is that that plate number was completely fabricated by Steven or right. Fabricated or, or wrong, you well, know, and he the, misremembered. Yeah. But I think at the end of the day too, it's like, you know, state route eight, you have State Route 8, and then you have the bridge. And if you're sitting at that bridge and you're looking towards State Route 8, that's a pretty far distance. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, the, the police actually speculated that maybe he couldn't even make out what kind of car it would be. So then you're going to tell me if you if you could barely make out the car, you're going to be able to make out a license plate? I think this was a lot of questioning by authority figures to a 14-year-old scared boy, uh, and they're leading him. And then he was like, oh, I'll just make up a number and we'll see what happens. Well, and you're exactly right here, Captain, because if, if the, if the kid can't even tell you if it's a, if it's a license plate or a bumper sticker that he's seeing, Mm -hmm. how is he seeing any numbers on that plate? So as law enforcement is retracing Lynn's steps, you know, talking with Steven, they go back to the, the fight with the parents that night. And then they start suspecting that maybe she ran away. Right. Yeah. They, they think they're probably looking for a runaway situation here, but on Thursday, the military organized a search party. And on that day, they end up finding Lynn. They found Lynn dead. Um, so they find her in that Lawson's Bush area, that wooded area we, we spoke of. Mm -hmm. She is laying there almost nude. She has been brutally raped and strangled, uh, with her blouse. Somebody used her blouse to strangle her. They find blood on her and around her. There is a cut on her leg. Um, She had one arm kind of up and out and the other one resting on her chest. So she's only wearing her bloodied undershirt. And of course, the, the blouse is tied around her neck. But there's some peculiar things here because her, her shoes and other clothing, they are neatly laid next to her. So the shoes are neatly placed next to her. Her socks are together, like paired and rolled up. Um, the zipper on her shorts was even zipped up. Mm-hmm. The She had a necklace. There was a necklace that she was wearing that they found hanging on a fence uh, nearby her body. Mm-hmm. And her killer has placed three small branches on top of her body. There are also some interesting so, go ahead well, hold on so uh, what is the suspicion here is it that she was raped and murdered in the bush or was she raped and murdered somewhere else uh at a different location and then placed there because to me it seems like if you if you're going to place the body and then beside it you're placing the 
the clothes mm -hmm. n nice and neatly folded. That's pretty strange. It's very strange, first of all. Um, but the theory here, the thought is, and I can only go off of what the inspectors were saying at the time. Mm -hmm. um, they said that they believe she was raped and killed in the same location that she was found. Mm -hmm. um, again, Do they with, give a reason why they believe that though. Well, I'm guessing here, Captain, but the statement of them finding blood on her and around her I'm guessing is what would lead one to cause that she believe that she got that injury that caused her to bleed at that location. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was probably some other indications that she would have been attacked and killed there. Yeah. And I think those are all probably good reasons to believe the only reason why I question it. And then maybe also start questioning the time of death and we'll get to the, that a little bit later, but that this is a secluded area, but it's not super secluded. Mm -hmm. It's just right off the road. And we also have plenty of eyewitnesses that we'll get to later that were on that road that day. Mm -hmm. And during this time period that the law, law enforcement is going to claim that she was murdered or that the, this attack took place. Right. So it's kind of suspicious there. So if, if in fact she is killed at this location, um, then the, this means that the killer took the time to straighten up her clothing basically you know, um, kind of laying it out neatly. I've almost, I've heard one person say that it was like almost folded, you know, like, like somebody would when you lay out clothes. Um, I, I don't know this to be true. That's just one report that I heard, but hearing that the socks were rolled up, mm -hmm. like paired that's, and rolled up together. And then that's how I fold my sock. And then the thought is that the zipper on the shorts possibly was that the killer zipped the shorts back up before, folding them up and laying them neatly next to her. Well, my hunch would that would be that the rape took place somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Maybe the murder took place in this area, but we're talking about, you know, if the motivation, which based on the evidence, the motivation for this murder would have been for the sexual assault, for the rape, mm -hmm. then you would assume that this individual wouldn't want to hurry that process. So I, I'm just, my hunch is that it took place somewhere else. And then, um, um, moved her there, but maybe murdered her there, which doesn't have to be a building or anything. It could be, or any type of structure. It could be the vehicle yeah. that she was seen getting into now. And I want to kind of stress something else here too. You know, I, I purposely said that the killer placed three small, small branches on top of her body, because when I first heard this report, I thought, well, that, that almost sounds to me like somebody trying to hide the bodies, trying to cover something up. I've seen pictures of these branches and that was definitely not the, the purpose of placing these on top of her. Okay. Um, they were considerably smaller than her from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, it, it to me, it, it means, it means something, but it, it, but it, it might mean the same weirdness that the clothing meant, if that makes sense. Um, you know, not well, trying it could to have been done in a state of panic or something. Mm hmm or there's the person's now not thinking clearly. And then they're like, Oh, well this will, this will cover up. And it's like, no, that's, those are small branches. There are some interesting tracks in the area of the body. Um, and I, and I want to stress that as well in the area of that, the body was found. Um, it's not clear to me with certain tracks, with the exception of these footprints, of how close these tracks were located to where they actually found her body. Like the captain said, you know, you could access this wooded area. You could drive up on a car or a bike to this area, but at some point you're not going to be able to drive into this wooded bush area. Um, and, and so you wouldn't expect to find these tracks right next to her body. Uh, but they did find a bike tire track leading the words are leading to the body. Mm -hmm. Um, there are footprints, like I said, now the, the bike tire tracks are not right next to the body, but these footprints are. And, um, these marks measure about 10 to 11 inches. They also find some, uh, vehicle tire tracks in the area as well. Mm -hmm. I don't think this would be uncommon to find bicycle or vehicle tire tracks in this area. You know, even if there wasn't a body there, um, now, yeah, the well, because especially once you start getting to the eyewitness accounts, you know, going into the bush or hanging out in the bush is something that kids did. Mm-hmm. 
So, you know, they would ride their bikes back there. And that the actual like dirt road that you went on or this gravel road that you went on, I think it was like loosely graveled, like mainly a dirt road, but wow, we put a little gravel down on there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think this was a, a road that was used by cars too. So again, like you were saying, very common that these tracks would be there. So now the, the property owner, this is Lawson, Farmer Lawson, and his neighbor, um, they both come forward with a story that they saw a vehicle with, that they dubbed a strange vehicle on the property um, sometime that night. That's that's the best they could narrow it down was sometime that night, um, possibly after dark. And the description they have of this vehicle is that it's a 52, possibly a 52 dark convertible, possibly a Ford. So not a very great description there. But again, like the captain said, in, in kind of what we were leading to in the trailer there, this is supposed to be an ordinary day. You might not notice, you know, you might not take note of a, of a proper vehicle description just by seeing a vehicle there. Somebody could use that. That could be a place where people frequently turn around in. You know, they figure out they're going the wrong way. Um, under the cover of darkness, though, I'll tell you what, Captain, that to me does not look like a place that I would pick to turn around in. Um, it doesn't seem... It, <laughs> but it's the only place on that, that road. But it doesn't seem to stand out enough for me is what I'm saying. If I were traveling in the dark, um, I think that I, well, I, we also have fields on, on both sides. Mm-hmm. So I think anytime you're on a country road and you see a split in the field, that's your chance to turn around. There's so much more to get into. Let's get into that right after this quick beer break. All right, we're back. Cheers, mates, and a uh, and a big happy birthday to the the colonel. Oh, thank you, Captain. It's the colonel's birthday. Uh, Wait, find him on Untapped. Follow him. Follow his drinking journey. You can harass me on Untapped, and and <laughs> <laughs> then tell him happy birthday. He's he's uh forty seven. If I'm not on uh, on there for a while, for a couple days, forty nine. He's forty nine. <laughs> All right, All right. Never mind. <laughs> Enough of this. All right. Captain. So 56. We have Harold Graham is a gentleman that is brought in to head the investigation. He is like a big shot. You know, mm-hmm. they bring him in from out of the area to lead the investigation. He tells the officers um, that they should be looking for a guy with obvious signs of injury, mainly looking for persons that may have scratches to the face, hands, and or arms. Um the thing here is that's what he tells the officers to be looking for. However, that's not who they arrest. And I'm going to jump ahead here a day uh, because we, we'll go back into some of these eyewitness accounts, but I think we got to set this up properly. And to do that, we got to explain that on June 12th, uh, shortly after 7 PM, Stephen Truscott, the 14 year old that had given the ride to young Lynn Harper, mm-hmm. he's taken into ca- into custody. And at about 2.30 a.m. on June 13th, he was charged with first-degree murder. Yeah, so he's questioned for how many hours? Um, It's about seven hours. Yeah, that's responsible. Let's question a 14-year-old that is probably scared out of his mind with no parent present, no lawyer present. We're going to question this individual for seven hours. And this is also back in, in, in the 50s. This is back when you were allowed to have leading questions. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're talking to a minor, you can't lead the question. Does that make sense? Right. There's laws against that. You can't. You have to have them uh, create the scenario, not you create this. So, again, they're probably creating the scenario over and over. Well, Stephen, even though he's interviewed for or interrogated, however you want to call it, for seven hours on that Friday night, he... He never confesses, um, but he does get close. I will say that he becomes confused towards the end of the questioning. And at some point, um, he tells the police about five that he saw five boys, uh, that he saw playing in the river. 
Um, this is trying to solidify his story of, you know, I dropped her off. Mm-hmm. I rode my bike back to the bridge. I stopped because I saw some kids I knew playing, turned and saw her get into a car. Um, apparently he gets two of the boys wrong. Um, but I think here still three out of five is pretty decent. Uh, I, I don't know the distance that he saw these kids or if he just mistook two of them for other kids. that well, he, knew. he went to a pretty small school, mm-hmm. so he should know everybody's name. But I mean, how many times did you like run into somebody and you're like, well, I, I know Jack and I know Timmy, right? Mm-hmm. But these other two guys, I'm not really for sure what their names are. Now, there's a note here regarding this, this uh, interrogation that says that at some point, you know, I said he became confused, but at some point, Stephen tells a doctor. Um, so apparently there were doctors present and we'll get into that more here in a minute, but at some point he tells a doctor present, but no lawyers present that he may have molested the girl that he may have molested Lynn Harper, but he couldn't remember. Um, yeah, I don't know what to make of this because I wasn't in that room. He's 14 years old and he's been, he's been interviewed and interrogated for hours by this point. Well, you have to question if he even said that, or did they put that on a piece of paper and he signed his name to it? And he, You know, so picture this. We have him being asked all these questions. Tell us your story. Tell us your story again. Tell us your story again. And then an officer leaves and another one comes in. Ask him the same questions. Tell Mm -hmm. us your story. Tell us your story again. You know, I'm I'm standing up for the kid and saying that I can see how a 14-year-old would become confused. Now, regarding the doctor. um, Yeah, but for seven hours, though, he stayed strong on his conviction that I, I, I'm not responsible for her disappearance. I'm not responsible for her murder. Right. You know, I dropped her off at, at state route eight and that's it. Mm-hmm. We didn't go in the bush. Right. Never happened. And so, yeah, that's why this whole willy nilly. Oh, well maybe, maybe I molested her. Like, no, I, I think that's all fabricated BS. Now, after he's arrested, he's like checked for injury. Right, they check his body for these injuries. They're looking for somebody that may have had scratches on them. You know, assuming right, they got DNA, you know, and they have skin and claw marks. They know that she put up a fight. Mm-hmm. So, and, but now you're going to arrest and charge this individual that has no signs of that, right? And he doesn't have any signs of that, but he does have a strange, um, let's say, injury. Um, they. Two of the doctors report that he has two quarter sized lesions on his penis. Um, the, the, okay. Okay. Well, the strange thing here, Captain, is that. Well, somebody, he just ruined somebody's lunch. Well, they said that these injuries were, you know, a sign that he brutally raped the girl, mm-hmm. that these were, the, were injuries caused by friction. Now, the thing here is he's, he's then, uh, checked out by a doctor the following day. Yeah. The, from the prison. Yeah. And this doctor says he has no signs of injury on his entire body at all. And actually doesn't make any reference to these lesions on the, on his penis. Um, and I imagine this is something that was supposed to be checked, um, regarding this, um, you know, we would eventually get an answer for this. Stephen Triscott uh, was said to have been suffering from some kind of skin uh, disorder. And he would get these different lesions, uh, dermatitis or something like that, that Mm -hmm. he was being treated by his family doctor for on a number of occasions. Now, the argument here is that, uh, you know... I don't know if this, uh, you know, illness or whatever you want to call it, Affects the the genitals, right? Um, that I don't know. I I don't know that, Captain. All I can state is that we have two doctors saying he has this thing, uh, has these injuries to to the penis, and one saying he doesn't. I don't know. He might have been a chronic pocket pool player. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest here with everybody. I don't know how to make heads or tails of this portion of the story. I, 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 well, look. Okay, so maybe there was something there. That they're blowing out of proportion. The third doctor didn't see it. It's possible. Mm -hmm. Or this is just fictitious bullshit that they they made up. And then the third doctor that is not on team, let's 
pin somebody for this murder. I'm just a doctor doing my job in the prison. I didn't see anything. You know, it's unlikely that these big lesions would get uh, healed within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So, again, I think some of this stuff is just fictitious, like him saying possibly that, oh, I possibly molested her. Look, that could have just been made up, too. You know, they're creating a narrative here, and that that is uh, dangerous waters. Well, they're working under a theory now. They they've pieced together a theory, and the theory is this: that that Stephen Triscott never made it to the bridge with with Lynn on his bike. That before they got to the bridge, they veered off and they went into Harper's Bush, and at some point, he attacked, raped, and killed the girl and left her body there. That's the the very general basic theory that they're working under. Now, we have several eyewitnesses, and there's going to be some problems with these eyewitnesses because we have, well, first of all, they're all children, Um, and we know how this can work. We've seen this in several different situations. Are you Um, calling children stupid? Yes. They're all very (laughs) stupid. No, I'm joking. Don't Please don't write to the show. It's my birthday. Uh, Somebody's going to write in. I can't believe the colonel called all children stupid. Just most of them. So we have. And if you'd like to write into us, that's at truecrimegarage at gmail.com. Put it on the blog so everybody can see how bad of a person I am. The, so the, here's the eyewitnesses, right, Captain? Mm-hmm. Let's go through these. First of all, the one that looks pretty tough if you're in the if you're in the defense seat here is this Jocelyn Gadette. Okay, she is somebody that that goes to school with Stephen Truscott. I believe she's 12 or 13 at this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, So she says that the day before the day before the um, before Lynn Harper went missing, that Stephen Triscott tried to make up some kind of date with her. You know, let's, let's book a date. Okay. Um, And this date ladies man was to go to Lawson's Bush Mm. uh, maybe for, you know, a, a little makeout session. Right. Uh, this was supposed to sesh. this okay. was supposed to take place just before 6 p.m. the evening of of Lynn going missing. Mm-hmm. Now it's also reported that Stephen Triscott stopped by Jocelyn's house that night to remind her of the date. Like, hey, don't forget. Yeah. So the thought is that he doesn't end up having this date with Jocelyn. He goes to the schoolyard. Mm -hmm. That's where then Lynn asked him for the ride. And he's like, Oh, plan B I'll take Lynn Harper to the bush with me. Right. I can talk her into this. Um, we got to kind of go through this in a, in a, in a strange way, captain, because there's a lot of information that's collected in the original investigation that will not come out until later. And yes. it'd be obvious for why, but I, I, while we're on each eyewitness, I want to kind of go through them one at a time and discuss everything that we know about their accounts. So we have a full story because it'd get mm-hmm. too confusing if we discuss it later. So there's some question as to the credibility of this Jocelyn Gadette story for several reasons. Okay. First of all, the saying that Stephen Triscott stopped by her house to remind her of the date. Right. Um, there's a big question if that even happened because Stephen Triscott says that I didn't ask her on a date. Right. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. She wishes there, there she wishes I asked her out on a date. Yeah. There's some, there's some things in the police notes that they would discover later that would, would kind of state that it's very unlikely that that situation happened, that Stephen Triscott stopped by to remind her of the date. Right. Um, whether there was a date scheduled or not, that isn't so much called into question other than Steven saying that we didn't, we didn't have a date scheduled. Now, um, she would later testify that she went to Lawson's Bush to look for Steven. And she also says that she went to look for Steven Triscott at Lawson's farm. Mm-hmm. Um, again, there's some different, differing times on, on, on these things here. Yeah. Cause when she goes to the farm, it's not like she just wanders around the farm. She actually runs into the farmer. Yeah. She talks to the farmer, ask him if he's seen Stephen Triscott. Um, and then later after Stephen Triscott is arrested, 
she goes back to the farmer because there's some discrepancy in the time that what time was she there asking and looking for Stephen Triscott. Right. And she asked the farmer to, you know, what time did I, was I here? Oh, well, that's not the time I told them. Could you, could you make it the same time that I told right, them? Right. And he says, no, I can't do that. Yeah, I'm, I, not I'm not going to do that. So basically, you know, this hussy, <laughs> can I call her? <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> Whatever. She's, she's making up stories that some guy asked her out on a date. Right. So we don't know if there was a date. That's questionable. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steven says, no, she says, yes, there's actually some letter too that kind of goes back and forth on that one. Well, the police notes somewhere it's noted by one of the investigators that, 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 that didn't happen. Right. Then the other thing is that he stopped by her house. There's, you know, we're questioning that now. And then she says, well, I went to the bush and this is what time I told the law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Now, if she was in that bush and. Uh, this attack was taking place. Wouldn't she see this individual? Right. Depending on what time, depending it was. on what time and her time could be wrong. She could have been looking for Steven at six o'clock. Remember, they're mm-hmm. supposed to have this date at six o'clock. I do believe that she's looking for Steven at some point. That doesn't yeah. seem to be a question because she, the farmer backs up that part of the story. The problem yeah. is that what hour was she actually out looking for Steven? Yeah. And, uh, and this timing is going to come into question. And do you want to get into that now about what? the timing, the de- the time of death? Yeah. Um, y- yeah, I guess we should, because it, it might get confusing if we don't. So it's pretty simple. Um, based on what she ate mm-hmm. is how they figured out the time frame. Now they figured out this time frame afterwards. Um, basically once they started trying to pin this onto Steven, they had to make sure that the murder took place within a certain time frame. Right. Because Stephen actually went somewhere that night. Yes. And so he, the murder would have had to take place before he actually went there. So it was like before 745, I believe, something like that. Yeah. So, well, let's go through this real quick. So we have Lynn Harper, who she left her home at 615 p.m. that night. Mm-hmm. And then she met Stephen Truska around 7 p.m., um, you know, this is a casual meeting bumped into him. Um, and now that's at 7 PM. Steven Triscott was seen back at the base around 8 PM and then back at home afterwards and was babysitting. So the time of death here is extremely crucial and very important because the time of death would, you basically have an hour. If Steven Triscott is your guy, Mm -hmm. then, then Lynn Harper needed to to have died between about 7.15 and 7.45. Mm-hmm. Uh, if she didn't die during that time, then Stephen Triscott could not have murdered her. Right. And so what time did they claim that she died? Right. So here's, here's where we go with this. So time of death, huge. The reports were prepared by a Dr. John Penniston. Now, Penniston, he, his opinion was based on his examination of Lynn's stomach contents during the autopsy. Uh, and the last, the, the time of her last meal was reported at 5 45 PM on June 9th, 1959. He told, he would later tell the jury that the stomach normally empties within two hours of eating Mm -hmm. and Lynn's stomach appeared to contain a full meal, meaning that she would have had to have died by 7 45 relying on these factors that Penniston provided to jurors. With, with his view that Lynn had died between 7 p.m. and 7.45 on June 9th, uh, this was a time when Truscott, he was admittedly in her company. Right. You know, so if Lynn was dead by 7.45, then it's basically a matter of logic that Stephen Truscott killed her. Yeah, and so a couple of problems with this, though, is like when, like we said, when Stephen returns to the base, does he act strange? No, he doesn't act strange. Does he have attack marks on him? No. Did the doctors find attack marks on him? No. Uh, So those are some issues there. The other issue here is then when experts come out and say, okay, how much is this, you know, what kind of scientific evidence is this? I've seen several evidence or several experts. Now, this is kind of talked about a lot, like in the JonBenet Ramsey case, (laughs) right? 
Uh, I actually thought there was more of a science to this. Now to see these experts come out and say, well, actually the only thing studying the stomach does is really kind of tells you the last meal Mm -hmm. or what's in the stomach, but it doesn't give you much of a timeline. So for example, if you took this evidence, now we're talking in the fifties, this test was done doing this test now would give you a window of about 12 hours. So, so technology, technology is way more advanced now. Science way more advanced now. And you're going to give a time frame of about 12 hours. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, let's, let's play along for now. Okay. Let's pretend that, <laughs> that you're able to come up with that precise time of death, a time of death, that precise within a, what do you say? Half an hour, 45 minutes. So that, what that means then captain is that if she died during that time, Stephen Triscott did it, especially if we can prove that nobody saw the two of them together on the bridge or at highway eight, because then that means our theory is right. That Stephen Triscott left with Lynn on his hand, handlebars veered off into the, the bush area, never made it to the bridge, never made it to highway eight. He attacks, rapes and kills her there and then returns back to the base on his bicycle. Right. So now we have to get some people to say that, uh, you know, he, he wasn't where he said he was. He didn't drop her off like he said he did. Mm -hmm. So this is where we, we enter a a character named Butch George. Um, he told another boy that he saw Steven Triscott with Lynn in the bush. Um, he was not called at the trial though. Um, because, there seems to be some question as to his accountability, his credibility, um, because his story changes often. Now, remember Jocelyn Gadette that we just spoke about. She says that she bumped into Butch George on the road the night of the murder, the night that she disappeared, and asked Butch if she had seen Stephen Triscott. Butch says no. Uh, Butch's story, like I said, would change many times. Yeah, That's, part of that is just being a scared kid. Mm-hmm. At some point, he does tell law enforcement that he saw Stephen Triska on the bridge, uh, and then later yeah, but says, "Was he also led that?" Well, no. he 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 says he only said that because Stephen Triska asked him to say that. Mm. Okay, now we have Philip Burns. This this kid is only ten years old. He's walking on the road. This is the road where you know he should have seen Stephen Triska and and Lynn Harper traveling together. He he's walking on this road just after 7 p.m. He says he never saw Lynn Harper, never saw Stephen Triska on the road at that time. So police now believe that if they were not on the road because of what Philip Burns says, 10 year old Philip Burns, if they're not on the road at this time, it's because the boy didn't see them because they were in the bush at this time. Okay, well, now we have some arguments against all of that. At the river, down at the river, playing at the river. Remember the boys in the river? We have Dougie Oates. He says he saw the two of them on the bike. Mm -hmm. He sees Lynn Harper, Stephen Triscott on the bike. They cross the bridge. They're heading toward Highway 8. There's, is, the, is Dougie close to the bridge or he's is he far away from the bridge? Um, from my notes here is that he's at the river playing alongside the uh, the bank there. Okay. Um, I don't know how close he is to the river. There, there's two eyewitnesses, two major eyewitnesses from the river, right? The one that's on the bank and then the one that's further down in the river fishing? He, yes. The one that the boy that's fishing in the river, his name is Gordon Logan. Okay. Well, let's stay on Dougie. Dougie okay. Oates. That's a good rap name. So Dougie Oates says he saw the two of them on the bike, cross the bridge, head toward Highway 8. Mm-hmm. So that backs up Stephen Triscott's story. We have Gordon Logan who says the same exact thing. He says he saw Stephen Triscott traveling, uh, going over the bridge, and then later sees Stephen Triscott on his bike by himself. So this whole story matches up with Stephen Triscott's. The police don't like this story. Okay, so you have Gordon Logan who's further away from the bridge. And they basically discredit Gordon Logan's story because they say, you know what, from that distance, he wouldn't have been able to tell who's on the bike. He wouldn't be able to, you know, discern if it's uh, Timmy or John or George or or Buck. 
you know, he wouldn't be able to tell who was on that bike. Regarding Dougie Oates, though, their their statement, whether he's telling the truth is complete, is a lot more strange to me, where they say, you know what, these boys are buddies with Stephen Triscott. They're just kind of banding together, and they're mm-hmm. going to have his back. They're probably making up a story that they saw him with Lynn Harper past the bridge. Right. We can't believe this story of these kids saying that. But let's go back to Philip Burns, the 10 year old who's walking alone on the road who says he doesn't see uh, Stephen Triscott. He doesn't see Lynn Harper. We can believe the 10 year old, but we're not going to believe these two boys that were in the river or playing well, by the river. They believe in whatever, whatever individual tells them the story that they need to pin this on Steven. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what they believe. 10 year old kid, no watch. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Look, when I was 16, I couldn't tell you what time it was if I didn't have a watch, right? Or even close. What time is it? I, 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 now's <laughs> the time. Okay, so, uh, but here, Captain, th- I want to throw this out there too, though. With this Philip Burns, 10 years old, walking by himself, doesn't see them. However, we have other witnesses, other children that say that they saw Philip Burns walking, that they passed Philip Burns walking on the street that they rode their bike past Philip right. Burns and he doesn't report having seen those then, children right. either. So it's not that he didn't see them. So it didn't happen. It's he didn't notice them. They, they could have very well have, a bunch of people though, right. is what you're saying. Right. He could, these it's, it's likely that these kids could have traveled past him on a bike and he may not have seen them for whatever reason. This kid was in his own world. Or, or uh, past 20 people. I didn't see any, I didn't see anything. Or Philip Burns is just confused about the whole situation. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. It, it, again to the, the difficult thing here for me is this happened on a Wednesday. She went missing on a Tuesday night. Okay. So Tuesday, but still you got the day before you have school the day before. Mm-hmm. Then you have the school the day after, cause they don't find her body right away. All right. So that, you know, we talked about this a lot with the Adnan Syed case. The que- you know, there's so many conflicting stories because they question so much later. But we're talking about kids that are a lot younger, mm-hmm. a ten year old, twelve year old. They're they're not going to remember what ha- if it happened on a Monday, a Tuesday, or a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, I think the cops just went, "Hey, well, this story fits our narrative, so let's go with that." And then I think they started doing this thing where they started burying all the stuff that contradicted it. Mm-hmm. And, and stop trying to do work. And yes, this horrible thing happened to a very young individual, a 12-year-old girl. But you, you got to do your job. You got to do your due diligence. You are, you, are, um, you are paid. It's your duty to find justice, not just find anybody that you can pin it on. Mm-hmm. But the, the problem here, though, is there are issues with Stephen Triscott's story. there's issues there. And what I'm going to do here, Captain, to kind of clean this up a bit, because this thing's a mess. Let's just start with the idea that he's a 14-year-old boy. There's going to be some, again, does he know the time? Look, all he's trying to do is tell you what he can remember. Mm -hmm. Well, to clean this up a bit, I say we throw out all of these eyewitness accounts. That's what I would do. I mean, the good and the bad and the ugly, all of them you got, I think you got, you have to throw them out. I can't, I can't sit here and believe that he wasn't seen at a certain time and then have other people tell me that he was seen at it. You can't pick one or the other, you mm-hmm. know, it what only one of those versions work. Only one of them happened. I don't, I don't, to me, I can't pick between the two. So I think you throw them both out. Well, yeah, if you look at his story, it's pretty simple. I pick her up at the school. We drive past the bush. We drive past the bridge. We stop at the stop sign. State Route 8. Drop mm-hmm. her off. I drive. I ride my bike back to the bridge. By the time I'm back at the bridge looking at people playing, I look back. I see her get into a car. Later on, I go back to the base. Then I go to babysit. That's his story. Right. Right. What are the obvious problems you see with that story, though? As an investigator, I'm looking at this thing, and I have obvious problems with this young man's story. I I don't have any problems with that story. But Okay, so my first issue is, why why does she all of a sudden want off the bike? If the whole plan was, and this I call this into question a little bit, too. 
if you're almost to the destination, why not just continue to, to receive the ride to the, the destination point? You know, you're maybe not she, very, maybe you, she felt bad for, for, you know, asking for a ride, you know, to the complete thing when she knows that he's just going to go play at the bridge. Mm-hmm. It, th- th- but that, I that's a big question. We're talking about 12 year old and 14 year olds. Right. You know what I mean, no, like, I know that. I know that, but not I, a lot of rhyme and reason here, but I have to make heads or tails of this thing. Right. So, so first of all, I have a problem with, it seems like she there, we're going to this, this predetermined destination. And then all of a sudden I need off the bike. Yeah, but it's not clear what she asked for. You're right. There's, There's, you know, because she could have just said, Hey, can you take me to the stop sign? Yeah, I'm going that way anyways. Right. And it's not that much further from the bridge. Right. You know, that's a lot different than, can you take me and you're going to ride your bike on a state route. I mean, I I don't know the area that well, but it seems like the, the, the road that they're on was less traveled than the state route eight. So, Maybe it was one of those things where it's like, yeah, well, I can take you to the stop sign, but you know, I'm, I really shouldn't be riding my bike on this road. Yeah, who knows? But that's not clear, so you can't sit there and say, well, I have a problem with this because it's not clear. But it's not clear from the beginning, so it's not, you know, I, that there's nothing nefarious going on with Stephen's story there. It's, it's just not clear. What you're right, but, but but that's I can have a problem with it being unclear. I perfectly can, and I'll tell right, you what—that that doesn't point to innocence or guilt. Well, there is some question as to if she wanted a ride to that specific location or if she just wanted a ride to the highway. I'll give you that much. Right. But then we have the other strange statement of, okay, if she only wanted a ride to the highway, then then when I get you to that point, why would you say I'll hitchhike the rest of the way? It it just doesn't it doesn't ring true to me. It seems very odd for several reasons. One, is she going to hitchhike there and how's she going to get back? She's going to hitchhike on the way back. Yeah, but I never heard that come from Steve and I, that, you know, that those statements that I heard about the hitchhiking came from the law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And I'd argue that you have seven hours of interrogation. You also have seven hours of leading the witness. You have seven hours of leading a 14 year old kid into a story that you want to hear. So, what did they write down? What notes did they make? What were correct? What what things were correct and what was not correct? I mean, you got two doctors saying that there's lesions on this kid's penis, and one doctor not even making references to it. Right? You think this would be a big deal? And there's constantly things like so. Again, so what what did the detectives write down of importance? And 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 then in their notes, what they wrote down was that actual statements from Stephen. Or just bullshit that they're writing down on a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is what actually comes out in court. You know, because the pro- a big problem with this case is going to be that when they try Stephen Truscott, back then, the, the prosecutors didn't have to provide everything. They didn't have to be f- fully disclose all of the information that they had collected throughout the investigation to the defense team. Mm-hmm. So what they're able to do is they're able to conduct their investigation, collect as much evidence as they can, as much information as they can. And they're able to sift through it and then say, okay, you're preparing for your defense. Here's a portion of what we've collected and what we found along the way. And you can build your defense against that. Well, you're right. And so here's the story that we came up with. This fits our narrative. The problem is, is if you give the rest of the notes that the police officers had, that contradicts the narrative, period. Mm-hmm. So the cops should have said, look, we we don't have a clear story because every time that we start getting somewhere, some leadway, guess what happens? Somebody else comes along and contradicts it. Right. Now, if it just happens once, okay, maybe it's just the, the eyewitnesses you know, mess up, right? Mm-hmm. But it happens over and over and over. You, you have to take a step back. You're the adult here. And you got to take a step back and go, well, maybe this this isn't our kid. Mm-hmm. right? This isn't, this isn't the person that we're looking for. All right, Captain. I think that we have to kind of put a bow on this for now because we're running out of time, but there's a lot more to discuss here. So to kind of clear this up, we have on September 16th, Stephen Truscott's trial began. Um, all the evidence presented in court was basically circumstantial. 
Uh, it, it's centered on placing Lynn Harper's time of death uh, within that very narrow time frame, mm -hmm. which implicated Stephen Triscott. Um, like we said, there were there were only certain sides of the argument that were presented at this trial. Now, a big problem here for the public and for the citizens was that they decided to charge Stephen Triscott as an adult, which means that he's going to be sentenced to death if he's convicted. Yeah, death by hanging. This was a very controversial thing at the time. Um, you know, we don't often see minors being charged and sentenced to death. He was ultimately convicted of this, and he was sentenced to death. Um, there are a lot of things that didn't come out in that trial that we need to get to, and we'll cover those, as well as is he guilty, not guilty in our eyes, and are there other potential suspects out there that could have done this? All right, again, happy birthday to the Colonel. We'll be back tomorrow in the garage. Make sure you go to the store page. We have the Douche Canoe shirts. What we did was we made them green mm -hmm. with uh, blue letters this time because I was getting tired of that blue. So we a bunch of people asked for them. Yes, said back every, by popular demand. We were receiving many emails every week about re the return of the Douche Canoe. So you can go to the website right now, truecrimegarage.com. Click on the store page, uh, pre-order one of those shirts today. Thanks to everybody for joining us in the garage today. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.